Hey class, welcome back. Today uh, we're talking about the musculoskeletal assessment. We're also talking about neurologic exam uh, and that'll be posted in a different lecture right after this one. So you can watch this one and then watch the other one. But a lot of times neuromuscular kind of goes together, especially when we're talking about strength coordination of muscle groups. But there are some particular areas where they're different, so I kind of broke them up just to make it easier for you. Most of the musculoskeletal complaints are going to be joint pain. So we'll need to review some of the common health history elements that you'll need to assess. The history should focus on the location of the pain, how the pain occurs, a description of the pain in order to determine if it's acute or chronic, um, localized or diffuse, inflammatory or non-inflammatory. While you're asking all these questions, your old cart questions, you should also ask the patient to point to the pain. This can save quite a bit of time since the patient description of the location of the pain is often vague or just inaccurate. Uh, I do this all the time with my husband. I tell him, can you rub my back? It hurts in the lower back. And he starts rubbing. I'm like, no, higher, higher, higher. And finally he's up in like my, my you know, thoracic, you know, cervical thoracic area. And he's like, this isn't your low back. I'm like, well, I felt like it was my low back. So you have to ask the patient to specifically point to where it hurts or try to figure out exactly where it hurts because their description might not always be accurate. Um, if there was an injury involved, if the patient injured themselves, was had an accident, you'll want to ask about the mechanism of injury uh, and how uh, that happened. The past medical history that's significant for musculoskeletal or joint pain includes previous injuries, gout, osteoarthritis, uh, diabetes, because diabetes can cause a, a joint softening, particularly in the foot, one called Charcot joint, where, where uh, the joints in the foot, you end up having an extra joint in the foot. It softens and kind of falls down through the, the bottom of your foot. I think there's some pictures later on, but it's pretty um, debilitating. Uh, pregnancy can also cause a lot of joint pain. Uh, ask about surgical history. Uh, for social history, the pertinent social history that you could ask about is exercise routine or lack thereof, and then employment, you know, if they're a, you know, um, a laborer and they have back pain, then that could be significant. Family history, specifically, you could ask about rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, fibrom fibromyalgia, uh, and uh, a number of others, rheumatologic um, issues. Generally, generally, when you think about musculoskeletal section, you should start with a visual inspection of the joint, including looking at the surrounding structures. You would then want to put the joint in motion, both passively and active, but initially just start off by looking at that. And when you're documenting, you can document that there's no gross um, abnormalities or no gross deformities. So it's not obviously deformed looking, you know, it's not um, atrophied and things like that. So look for, um, and then after inspection, you can palpate and percuss. So you can percuss and palpate the, the joint muscle for atrophy, for nodules. Look for crepitus, which is that creaking uh, change when you're putting the, the joint through range of mo motion. Excuse me. And look for inflammatory changes, things like swelling, warmth, tenderness, redness, things like that. Uh, next section. So when you are putting a muscle group um, through range of motion, that's a musculoskeletal examination. That's part of the musculoskeletal exam. But when you are putting the muscle uh, or the, the joint through range of motion against resistance, that becomes strength testing. And that is neurologic examination. And we'll cover that in the neuro section later. Okay. So uh, this is the order that will go through the musculoskeletal section by section, starting at the hands, fingers, wrist, then moving distally to the elbow, shoulder, We'll review the spine going down the hip, knee, and finally the ankles and the feet. And generally, you'll perform a joint-specific examination because uh, usually patients come in for one specific you know, joint that's hurting, their ankle or their knee or their shoulder. Uh, you, don't, you won't generally perform the entire you know, head-to-toe joint exam, but there are situations where you'll want to assess multiple or more than one joints. Um, things like systemic muscular degenerative diseases like um, uh, muscular dystrophy, Parkinson's. Uh, after car accidents, if someone comes in for uh, MCV, <clears throat> excuse me, then um, even though they come in for elbow pain, you'll, you're going to want to look at all the joints or at least more than just the, the elbow. Um, 
And definitely if you work in an orthopedic clinic, you will be assessing multiple joints. Um, generally speaking, if the knee hurts, we look at the joint above and below it because knee pain could be due to an ankle injury or hip injury and the body's just compensating differently. So uh, always consider looking at the joint above and below the site of complaints. So if they're complaining of elbow, look at the uh, shoulder and look at the wrist, at least briefly. We'll start discussing the hand and wrist, and uh, this picture demonstrates the basic anatomy. It's helpful to have access to pictures like this when you're trying to remember what to call certain joints or certain areas of the hand. So you can't always remember all these different things, so you have to uh, be able to look them up quickly or have them um, at your at your disposal. My um, my friend, who is a, a plastic surgeon down at Rush um, in Baltimore, he he's a big shot hand surgeon. Does a lot of hand um, ish, uh, hand surgery, and but when he, even when he dictates, I remember him telling a story that he had the nurse after a big case that they did. He had the nurse bring up a um, hand anatomy picture on the you know, smart board that they have in their OR. And so he's sitting there calling in his dictation, looking at the hand anatomy picture so that he can make sure to call things by their correct name. So even big shot surgeons uh, who um, do a lot of hand surgery will do this. So make sure that you have these charts accessible. Look things up if you can't remember what to call them, especially in your documentation, because you don't want to be like the thumb joint is red, you know, so make sure that you're calling it the DIP or um, making sure you're getting the particular joint. When you're inspecting the hand, you're going to look for swelling, deformity, any muscle atrophy, especially in that, in that, um, the base of the thumb can have atrophy if there's some weakness in the hand. Look for nodules, joint symmetry, <clears throat> and then um, the patient's ability to make a fist, which tests the function of the hand. You'll palpate the distal are the different joints, including the um, DIP, the distal um, interphalangeal joint, the PIP, the proximal interphalangeal joint, and the MCP, as well as those eight carpal bones, which you're not expected to remember. Um, also, you'll want to palpate that anatomical snuff box. This is just distal to the radial styloid process. It's best seen when the thumb is extended laterally away from the hand and kind of um, causes that little triangle uh, to form at the base of the thumb. And we can go over this in, in, in lab, and it's also in your videos, your skills video. But pain over that area, pain over that anatomical snuff box, has clinical significance in that it can represent a styloid bone fracture, which doesn't have much blood supply to it. And if you end up fracturing that styloid bone, then it can lead to um, necros avascular necrosis and bone death there. This is usually seen from, um, from boxing, from hitting, you know, having getting in a fight punching a wall people who punch a wall uh, will often fracture that bone here's a picture of a couple of the different nodes that you can see her burdens um, a her burdens nodes are hard non-tender um, usually in the, in the DIP joints whereas Bouchard's nodes are uh, more proximal um, and uh, involve the PIP joints here's that anatomical snuff box as well a couple special tests that you can do in special situations if you if you are concerned that the patient might have carpal, syndal, carpal tunnel syndrome, you can test what's called a tunnel sign, um, and you hyperextend the wrist and tap the median nerve with your middle finger. A positive sign then is um, pain or paresthesia radiating down, radiating down into the palm, uh, the index in the middle um, and lateral half of the ring finger. And there's a picture coming up, I think, that um, shows that normal distribution of carpal tunnel syndrome um, symptoms. Another test you can do is the phalanx test. You, uh, you flex the wrist 90 degrees, maintain it for 60 seconds, and a positive test again would be pain in that normal distribution, that normal carpal tunnel distribution. This tends to be a little bit more sensitive than tunnel sign. Um, hand grips, you can have the patient squeeze your, uh, two of your fingers. You don't want to use more than two fingers because it, it can really hurt if, they're, if they have a strong grasp. Um, grasp sorry. Um, and you're documenting that the hand grips are equal, they're you know bilaterally, or they're unequal, or they're decreased. Um, and this can indicate weakness of the finger flexors and or the hand muscles. If it's unilateral, sometimes it's a neck um, um, issue, a cervical issue that has radiculopathy down into the one of the hands. 
Finkelstein's test. Uh, this is when patients come in for wrist pain or thumb pain. You'll want to check this. It's a uh, test for de Quervain's tenosynovitis. So you have the patient put their thumb inside their fist and make a fist. And then you um, move the wrist towards midline in an ulnar deviation. So you're stretching out this ligament right here by, by um, extending uh, the, the wrist in this way. Or that what we call ulnar deviation. If there's pain in this area right here, then this indicates um, de Quervain's tenosynovitis. Usually in class, you know, in a class of 10 to 20 people, if we all do this, there's going to be at least, you know, at least one or two people that says, oh yeah, that hurts, because we all kind of do a lot of repetitive motion, we do a lot of typing, uh, so it's, it's common that someone has de Quervain's tenosynovitis. The median nerve compression test, this is actually my, my favorite test for carpal tunnel syndrome, it's the most accurate. Uh, you firmly compress the median nerve with your thumb at the flexor um, uh, area for 40 seconds, and a positive test indicates um, carpal tunnel syndrome. And if it's positive, there'll be pain and paresthesia in that normal um, nerve distribution. And here's the picture of that normal distribution uh, for carpal tunnel syndrome. It's this median nerve here. So these fingers on the palmar and these fingers on the ventral um, as posterior and, and anterior view. So take a look at this picture. It shows you kind of where they should have symptoms if they have uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, just briefly, carpal tunnel syndrome is caused by compression of the median nerve during that, in that carpal tunnel, which kind of sits between the, in the wrist between, at the base of the hand. Usually there's symptoms of numbness and tingling, aching and pain in the wrist, forearm, and hand, sometimes hand weakness as it progresses. It tends to be worse at night, intermittent, gradual onset. It's really common in women more than men. It's really common in pregnancy in that fluid overloaded um, status because uh, when there's extra fluid, it causes more of the compression of the nerves. People with high BMIs and then people with repetitive motion. So a lot of people who are doing typing, a lot of people in school, a lot of people that work on computers uh, will end, end up with some carpal tunnel syndrome. Moving on to the elbow examination, the two big areas of the elbow that I want you guys to know um, are the medial and lateral epicondyle, which we'll talk about in a bit. So there's really only kind of three different areas. You have the olecranon, which is the um, which is your elbow. You know, that's kind of your elbow bone that people always think that's called your olecranon. Um, and then on each side of the olecranon, you have a groove. And then you have another bone, medial and lateral. And those are your epicondyles, your medial epicondyle and your lateral epicondyle. So you'll feel those different areas. Feel for any tenderness or pain. Usually people that come in will either be coming in for olecranon bursitis, where there's a big bursa sac at the end of the elbow. Uh, it looks like there's a tennis ball in there, and it sometimes is red and inflamed and painful. And that's a bursitis. So you can drain those, put some steroids in them. Um, and then those will kind of go away. Uh, the other reason is that people come in for um, for elbow pain is going to be the medial and lateral epicondylitis, what we call golfer's elbow or tennis elbow. And they have a lot of pain, and pain just to even palpate. So when you when they come in and say, I have pain in my elbow, if, you f if there's pain over the olecranon, it's most likely going to be um, you know, either medial or lateral epicondylitis. So you treat with anti-inflammatories, and you'll learn more about the treatment later, but uh, for right now, just assess those areas. Looking for swelling, looking for redness, but really palpating is going to be the, um, the gold standard test there. The shoulder examination. Yeah, students often worry about the shoulder exam because there's so many different tests, and it's kind of this, uh, you know, kind of hidden object in deep in your shoulder. You can't really see much. You can see some of the bony landmarks in some people with the clavicle and the acromioclavicular um, joint and the acromion, but a lot of the times you can't really see what you're doing, so you have to go by feel and, um, and some special tests. When someone comes in for shoulder pain or when you need to examine the shoulder, you should start obviously with inspection like you always do. Look for deformity, look for muscle atrophy, Look to see if the shoulder is drooping or it's lower than the other one. If their you know if their shoulder is dislocated, it'll be out of place and kind of um, slanted. You know, there won't be um, uh, it won't be at the same level as the other one. Um, 
if there is some muscle atrophy, that actually occurs pretty quickly, within a couple weeks, usually within two weeks uh, of a rotator cuff tear, there will be atrophy of the shoulder and the muscles surrounding that. When you palpate the shoulder joint, you should begin medial to the sternoclavicular joint along the clavicles. So um, start medial, walk your fingers along the clavicle, and feel the acromion, the AC joint, the, the coracoid process, and the greater and lesser tubercle. And these are all in your video as well, so you can walk through these as, as well. You can also feel uh, from behind, you can feel that the bony spine of the, of the uh, scapula laterally. And then upward, um, you can feel, so if you cup your fingers behind your, your shoulder, uh, you can feel that bony, that bony ridge or that bony spine of the, of the scapula. If you walk lateral, around laterally and upward until it becomes the acromion. Uh, so that's the, kind of the summit of the shoulder. So you can usually find the acromion. Most people you can find the clavicle and the acromion, and the rest of it you can kind of, uh, not guess, but you can kind of determine where it's at based on on where the acromion and the um, clavicle are. You can palpate the sits muscles, um, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and the subscapularis. You can't palpate the subscapularis because it is ben beneath the scapula, uh, but the rest of these you can palpate those muscles, and the connection of those muscles tends to be in that deltoid region, so people that have pain in the lateral aspect of the deltoid region could have some um, sits muscle rotator cuff um, uh, sprain or, or strain. You can also palpate the bicipital groove of the, or should um, palpate the bicipital groove of the uh, shoulders, the anterior aspect of the shoulder. Um, you can palpate the subacromial and subdeltal bursa and um, the rotator cuff, which are those sits muscles and the sits, uh, the ligaments that connect them. Uh, this again goes, goes through each one of these and the palpation of them in your um, skills video. The range of motion that the shoulder goes through is flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction, and then internal and external rotation. So review your video. Uh, for these if you don't know uh, what these are. Uh, quickly, I always remember, um, you know, adduction and abduction is tough because it's like, wait, which one is away and which one is, is cross? So add, A-D-D, is you are adding to your body. So you're at, you know, usually your cross arm or you're bringing your, your, um, the joint closer to you. Whereas abduction is taking something away, right? If someone's abducted, they're taken away. So with adduction, you're um, raising your arm um, to the side, so you're pushing, you're taking it away from the body. This is a special test called the cross arm test. And it also should look familiar because it's right here. It's also part of adduction, so you're adding to your body. Adduction, cross arm test, and this can assess the AC joint to see if there's any um, impingement and things like that. This is the aptly scratch test. This is internal and external rotation. Um, this you can um, also do because it can also be a special test to assess for the rotator cuff um, for um, patients with pain. So if they have pain with external rotation or this aptly scratch test, then it could be a rotator cuff issue. The empty can test, uh, test for the supraspinatus muscle. Um, so you just have the patient hold their hands out and pretend like they're emptying a can. So they rotate their um, thumbs down like they're emptying the can in their hand. Uh, you can press down on their uh, arms and have them um, try to keep their arms in the same position So um, to see if they have pain with that. Speed's test is a test for bicipital tendonitis. So this will um, ha ha cause that pain in the anterior aspect of the shoulder. So review your video for that. Um, this can also indicate a labral disorder. <clears throat> the labral disorders are a little bit harder to assess for because they don't really show up easily on MRI and easily on, on examination. So a lot of times those chronic shoulder pains that you just can't figure out, you know, you've rested it, you've done the ibuprofen, they still come in and say, I still have shoulder pain. They don't have anything, you know, classic like, you know, adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder. So you send them to um, orthopod. They get scoped and they get things cleaned up and they probably have a little labral disorder or labral tear. But remember your um, 
referrals here. I mean, most orthopods are fairly easy to get into. There's a number of orthopedic um, providers in, uh, on, you know, in most areas. So for uh, the patients that don't have classic symptoms that you can treat in the office, or you think that they have more progressive issues, then feel, uh, make sure that you're uh, putting in your appropriate referrals. Near sign is another um, test. It's a test for impingement um, uh, symptoms. So you press on the scapula, stabilize the scapula from moving with your uh, right hand. Then with your other hand, the left hand, you raise the patient's arm. And this compresses that greater tuberosity of the humerus against that acromion, and it causes a pinching of the rotator cuff muscles underneath that acromio, or the coracoid acromio arch. And so it, if there's some impingement, it will cause um, pain. Hawkins sign, um, this is a test for um, rotator cuff, specifically a supraspinatus tendon. And this also causes compression of the greater tuberosity against that coracoid, um, cora, coracoacromial sorry, ligament. Um, so you are flexing the patient's elbow um, to 90 degrees with the palm down, and then supporting the elbow, you rotate the arm internally, and so that's really pinching, um, pinching or compressing that greater tuberosity against that ligament. And uh, if there's inflammation or irritation there, it'll cause pain. Drop arm sign uh, is a um, test you can do if you suspect rotator cuff disorder, specific, uh, specifically supraspinatus tendon. You have the patient adduct the arm and then to 90 degrees and slowly lower it. This is a really common test. It's really easy to do. Um, a lot of times patients will be able to adduct their arm, but then when you ask them to slowly lower it, that's when the muscle really gets activated and, the, and um, they can't do that very well. So they kind of drop it. They don't have the control. Uh, to lower it slowly. Apprehension test is a funny little test where um, you are um, kind of ex over externally rotating the uh, shoulder and looking for signs of apprehension on their face. So it's pretty funny, but uh, I show you how to do that in your skills video. So take a look at that. Okay, so normally the shoulder um, should be symmetrical from side to side. There shouldn't be any gross deformity, should be even, shouldn't be red. If you're looking for um, abnormalities, a shoulder dislocation might have that flattened lateral aspect. Um, we'll have unequal arm length with the dislocated arm being longer. Um, you'll have pain with any sort of manipulation. I dated a guy in college who dislocated his shoulder every time he turned around pretty much. I mean, I think he's, he dislocated it four times that I remember while I was dating him. I didn't even date him for that long, but one time he was playing basketball and he reached up to get a rebound and just reaching up to get a, to get a ball um, dislocated his arm, dislocated his shoulder. So I had to take him to the emergency room. This is when I was in nursing school, I think. So I didn't, um, I wasn't the bold person. Now I'd be like, hey, can I try to, can I try to relocate it? Um, so I, I was taking him to the emergency room <clears throat> so the professionals could do their, their jobs. And um, every bump we hit, every time we just hit a little bump in the road, uh, he would like scream out in pain. So it, it's supposed to be one of the you know top three most painful uh, conditions. But um, every, any little bit of manipulation can can really uh, cause significant um, pain here. Uh, rotator cuff tears. Uh, usually the, the rotator cuff, you have tears or tendonitis. Um, you can have bicipital tendonitis. Remember that tends to be more lateral over that bicipital groove. Uh, and then frozen shoulder, what we call adhesive capsulitis, is unilateral decrease in range of motion. So, and there's not usually pain. It's usually just frozen. You know, usually it started out with, oh, I hurt my shoulder at some, uh, you know, undisclosed point in time. So you quit moving it, or you quit using it because it hurt, and then your shoulder, the inflammation settles down, but so does, you know, kind of scars down. So you can't then rotate your shoulder very well. You don't have the range of motion anymore. So, so women come in sometimes unable to brush their hair because they have this adhesive capsulitis, and it doesn't really um, hurt that much. It just can't move it much. Then obviously sprains and strains, which are usually um, traumatic of some sort. 
Okay, moving on to the spine. The spine includes the neck, spine, back, and then um, eventually down at the hip. So um, you want to start at the neck, make sure that the um, head is erect and that there's no torticollis or lateral deviation of the head. Uh, you're looking at the patient to see that they have smooth and coordinated movements, that they have a normal and easy gait. They're not stooped. They don't have kyphosis. They don't, um, you know, have um, a wide uh, width to their their walk, their ba the base of their walk in between their feet. And we'll, I think we talk about that in the neurologic assessment, um, how their um, their base width of their walk should not be too wide. As you continue to inspect the spine, you'll want to inspect the um, anterior and the posterior and the lateral spine. And usually this is done when the patient stand, is standing uh, in a comfortable and kind of normal position with feet together. You might also want to have the patient flex forward to inspect some of the structures. Um, inspecting the posterior spine, you'll note the spinous processes, which are typically prominent at C7. Uh, or T1. If there's two of them, then it's C7 and T1. Uh, these are more prominent when you have the patient flex their neck forward, and you can feel that um, prominent uh, spinous process. You can also see the iliac crests, which are around the level of L3, um, and these mark the like the superior part of the hip, the superior most part of the hip. And then finally, the posterior superior iliac spine. Um, is the posterior most aspect of the crest, and it usually has those two little kind of skin dimples on each side of the vertebral column. So if you're down at the beach, start looking at everybody's lower back in their swimsuits, and you can kind of see these little skin dimples, um, and that's that posterior um, superior iliac spine, or, or what we call the PSIS. Um, you'll, you should see uh, on the lateral aspect this normal sort of S curvature, where the, there's cervical concavity and then thoracic convexity and then finally the lumbar con concavity again or what we call lumbar lordosis. So here you can see that normal S curvature. Um, the neck should have this normal kind of concavity here, the convexity of the thoracic spine and then um, the lordosis of the concavity of the lumbar area. When people have muscle sprains, especially in their back sprains and strains, they, the muscles tend to become so tight right in here that you lose this lordosis, you lose this concavity and it becomes more flattened. So the loss of lumbar lordosis can sometimes indicate um, you know, back pain and back spasms. Here you can see those two little skin dimples that I was talking about on the other side from the posterior superior iliac spine. And here you can see that um, T7 and C1 um, processes as well. You can palpate each process uh, from the neck down to the spine with your thumb, looking for any step-off sign, which is when um, one vertebra either is too far out or, or too far in. Um, it, so it's either prominent or it's recessed. You can look for um, tenderness, which can indicate discitis or uh, compression fracture or inflammation, especially if someone's complaining of back pain, you'd want to do that. Facet joints are joints that are deep to the trapezius muscle, so the uh, patient's muscles have to really be relaxed in order to feel these. Often you can't feel these at all, but they're in the cervical vertebrae. They're the lateral aspects of the vertebrae. So if you remember, the vertebrae um, in the cervical spine kind of has those wings. So there's the vertebral process, the part that kind of is in the back um, of the cervical spine, but then they have those wings on the side, if you can picture a vertebra on the cervical spine. So these are the joint processes, the facet joints are the joint processes um, lateral to the spinous process. So to feel these, you can ask the patient to relax their neck and try to palpate deep into the neck, but often, again, you can't feel these, but you will see these be reported on x-rays. You know, if you get a cervical spine X-ray, you might hear, you might, um, they might note, you know, that there's, that there's facet joint arthritis or something. The paravertebral muscles are just that; they're the muscles uh, on the sides of the vertebra. Uh, so, um, if there's spasming or pain, then these can indicate these can feel firm or knotted if they have spasms. You can also palpate the sciatic nerve. Um, 
and this is uh, easy to palpate uh, between the greater trochanter and the ischial tuberosity in patients who are lying on their side with their um, hip flex. I think there's some pictures coming up. So this picture demonstrates the common spinal landmarks you'll want to know. Um, you can see the pair of vertebral muscles on the right side of the vertebral column right here. Obviously, these would be on the other side as well. They just didn't picture them on both sides. And the iliac crest, which is the superior most portion of the pelvis, is around L3. Um, and the iliac spine, or the posterior superior iliac crest, that's that PSIS, is at L5. And that's the ones marked by those um, skin dimples there, the PS, um, PSIS. So note, and you might see these skin dimples um, and that's L5. So if you're traveling, if you, you know, if there's pain and you want to determine which vertebra you think the pain is or if you're the, the general location, um, you can use those landmarks. This, the straight leg raise sign is actually, it's a test that we do when patients have low back pain. It can um, increase or decrease your suspicion for herniated discs. Uh, and the symptoms are suggestive of sciatica. So with the patient supine and the knee straight, you raise the patient's affected leg. Uh, so if they have pain on the right side of their lower back, you raise their right leg. And if pain occurs uh, in the back, you note the degree of elevation where the pain starts. So how high was the leg when the pain started hurting in the back or in the leg? And then, because um, it's in that really sciatic distribution. So sometimes patients feel it in their back, sometimes it's back all the way radiating down their leg. Um, pain in that sciatic distribution from the back to the buttock down the, down the leg um, at about 30 to 40 to 50 degrees is positive straight leg raise test and indicates a possible herniated disc. But remember, herniated discs are very, very, very common uh, and a large percentage of the population has asymmetric or asymptomatic uh, herniated discs. So, um, but definitely when someone comes in for back pain, this is worth uh, doing. Uh, you can also do this to, on the opposite leg. So if they have pain in the right side, you can do this on the left side. Um, you can raise the left leg to see if um, it causes pain in the affected leg. Uh, and if they raise the, sorry, so if they have pain in the right side, if you raise the patient's left leg and it causes pain, in the affected leg, so in the right leg, even when the unaffected leg is raised, it's called a positive straight, straight, positive cross straight leg raising sign. So does that make sense? It's similar to when we talk about the abdominal, um, the abdominal examination when we're talking about Rovzings, which is um, you know when you push in the left side and you let go, it causes pain in the right side. Same sort of thing. Um, so even though there's pain in the right side, when you raise the left side, it should still cause pain in the right side. Okay. Um, the hip inspection and palpation, we've talked about some of these areas because of the back examination, but the iliac crest is again about L3, L4. Um, the anterior superior iliac spine, that's the, the um, hip bone in the front of your body, that's that kind of one that sticks out a little bit, or, or maybe doesn't. Uh, the, greater cro the greater trochanter is the lateral aspect, and then the pubic symphysis is that you generally at the same level as the, as the greater trochanter trochanter um, and is anterior. So here's a picture of those different areas. Here's your iliac crest. Here's the anterior superior iliac spine. So that part that if you kind of jut your hip forward, that's that bone that you'll feel. Um, and then you can know, see here all the different bursa sacs that are over every, you know, all over the place here in the hip. So you have a lot of uh, possibility for bursitis in the hip because there's a lot of different bursa sacs here. The posterior superior iliac spine, um, again, is, is those dimples just above the buttocks um, on the skin, the skin dimples. The greater trochanter usually will be about the level of the gluteal fold. Um, and, uh, on the, and then the ischial tuberosity, uh, the issue tuberosity are the, the um, IT bones or the butt bones. So when someone bony with a bony little butt sits on your lap and you feel those two bones in their butt, those are their ischial tuberosities or what we call kind of the butt bones to layman's terms. 
the sacroiliac joints, these aren't usually palpable, but they would be deep to the posterior superior iliac spine. And then the sciatic nerve, again, is um, palpable more commonly when patients are um, lying on their side and they flex their hip and the nerve lies kind of right between that greater trochanter and the ischial tuberosity or the butt bone. So in between the butt bones and the hip, and if you press in there, then that's kind of the anatomical location of where the, the um, sciatic nerve sits. And so pain there, uh, compression of that area, if it causes sciatic distribution pain, uh, then can indicate sciatica. So here's a picture of those that posterior. So it looks very similar to the anterior, hip, but you're seeing the opposite side of that, the posterior side of that. So here's your posterior suprailiac spine, PSIS. Um, here's the different ischial tuberosities, and then the bursa sacs or, um, that lie over the tuberosities, trochanter, the greater trochanter. So take a look at that and make sure that you have a basic understanding of the hip uh, anatomy. When you're inspecting the hip, it really is about looking at the gait. So the first part is just watching the patient move, watching the patient walk. The gait should be smooth, it should be continuous. Oh, and here we talk about the base width. So the base width of their walk, of their gait, um, shouldn't be any greater than four inches. So what I mean by this is if the patient's walking in mud or the patient's walking in snow, and you can see um, their footprints, their footsteps, in between their foot steps shouldn't be wider than four inches. Um, so if it is, then that can indicate cerebellar disease or a potential foot disorder. So this is that person, you know, is kind of waddles, you know, except for pregnancy. Pregnancy is really common to have a, a wide, <laughs> a wide um, base width uh, to their walk because they kind of waddle, right? They're kind of off balance, so you want a bigger um, base uh, width to your gait. You can measure leg length if the patient um, is complaining of hip pain, um, leg shortening uh, or leg um, lengthening. Uh, usually it's a congenital thing uh, and present, but it can get become more problematic as the, as the patient ages. Um, if it's acute, if there's an acute leg shortening with external rotation, that suggests a hip fracture, that the hip has been dislocated and fractured. So anybody that has that external rotation to one of their legs complaining of, of hip pain should have um, x-rays to, to um, look for a fracture. Uh, the inguinal ligament, this is that, in, that ligament that runs from the ASIS, or the anterior superior iliac spine, to the pubic symphysis. These are those things that I call the, you know, the marky mark ligaments. Um, because of that Calvin Klein underwear um, thing that he did years ago. I guess it was probably 30 years ago, but still memorable. Uh, the Gleazy's test is um, a test, a pediatric test that we look at with kids where we um, just lay them down and flex their um, hips and put their knees up. And we're testing to see and looking to see if there's difference in knee height, which can indicate hip um, problems, hip dysplasias, or um, leg length discrepancies, which could cause pain uh, in later in life as the patient starts to um, compensate for that. You can palpate a whole bunch of different areas of the hip. You can palpate uh, the bursa sacs generally, um, and also the sciatic notch, which is another really common area. So here's a picture of the trochanteric bursa, and then the ischial gluteal bursa deep to that which are, these are over the, this is over the IT bone, and then this is over the greater trochanter. Okay, so that's a hip in a nutshell. Uh, we're going to move on to the examination of the knee. And we'll start briefly by reviewing some of the basic landmarks of the knee in order to understand the underlying potential pathology, which luckily for the knee exam, it can be easy on a knee that you can identify. So if the person isn't super muscular or super um, or have a lot of extra tissue, then the knee exam can be somewhat um, easy. Um, so if you think of it as a box with the medial and lateral epicondyle of the femur, these mark the superior lateral and um, superior medial aspects. And then the head of the fibula marks the lower lateral aspect 
And then, and this is all, uh, again, on the anterior aspect of the knee. So you should be able to un identify these different areas. Um, and then the patella, obviously, and then um, beneath it, so beneath the patella, which you can't see here, beneath the patella will be the tibial tuberosity. Uh, and then there's a patellar tendon that kind of runs between the patella and the tibial tuberosity. So again, landmarks are pretty hard to identify when the patient is obese or when there's a lot of swelling or effusions in the knee. But think of it as this box where the femur, the lateral epicondyle and the medial epicondyle of the femur are the top part of the box. And then the bottom part of the box is this um, uh, medial um, condyle of the tibia. And then of the fibula, you have the, um, the lateral condyle. You have the tibia and the head of the fibula. Kind of, so you have box, 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 box. Okay, and the reason this is helpful is because the ligaments, you know, if there's pain right on, on the inside here, then it can be, this is the lateral side, if there's pain on the lateral side here, then it's probably, or could be anyway, this lateral collateral ligament. The lateral collateral ligament holds the top of the lateral aspect of the box together, and on the medial side, there's a similar one, but it's called the medial collateral ligament. So it's nice that they're called, um, by anatomical location because it makes things a lot more simple. So those hold the top and the bottom of the box together, the collateral ligaments, lateral collateral and medial collateral ligament. The inside of the box is held together by these ligaments that form an X, kind of uh, an X uh, from here and there. And this is your ACL and your PCL, your posterior cruciate ligament and your anterior cruciate ligament. So that gives you some stability to the box. Uh, whereas the, the um, lateral collateral and the medial collateral just keep the box together, uh, it would still be sort of flimsy without the ACL and the PCL holding the internal aspects of the box together in this kind of X-like pattern. And then you have the patella again, and then the patellar tendon that runs down and t attaches to the tuberal tuberosity. So it, it's, it's nice that things are called by their anatomical location here in the knee because it does make things a lot uh, more simple. Okay, um, inspection of the knee starts with gait, looking at the smooth rhythmic flow of the gait, looking at alignment of the knees, looking for any muscle atrophy. Uh, and if someone tears their ACL, muscle atrophy occurs pretty quickly. I remember my uh, best friend in, in college um, she tore her ACL when we were playing basketball one day, and so she was in, um, you know, a brace for, I don't even remember how long, six weeks or something, um, and her leg, when she got out of the brace, her leg was almost half the size, or her thigh was like half the size of her other thigh, just because she just hadn't worked out and hadn't been running, hadn't been walking on it, and had so much muscle atrophy in that, in that leg. So the muscle atrophy can occur fairly quickly. You'll palpate those medial surfaces that we just talked about, the medial con epicondyle of the femur, the medial condyle of the tibia, uh, the meniscus. Oh, I didn't talk about the meniscus real quick. Let me go back to this picture. The meniscus then um, sits inside the box and, um, and kind of um, acts as a cushion between the lateral epicondyle and the um, lateral condyle of the tibia. So it's this kind of cushion area between, between those two. And there's another one, there's a medial uh, one on the medial side. So you have your lateral meniscus and your medial meniscus. So if there's pain in the middle of the lateral aspect of the knee, it's either going to be this lateral collateral ligament or it's going to be the medial meniscus. Usually the lateral collateral ligament will hurt more at the attachment sites and not right in the middle of it. So if there's pain right in the middle of the ligament, then it's more likely going to be the meniscus. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so you'll palpate all these different surfaces. Um, on the posterior aspect of the knee, um, oh sorry, we're still on the anterior. There, you'll also palpate the patella, the patella uh, tendon, and then you can palpate some of the bursa, but again, you won't feel the bursa unless it's swollen or inflamed. Um, and then the tubular tuberosity. On the lateral aspect of the knee, we already talked about this in the picture, but you have the lateral epicondyle of the femur, the lateral condyle of the tibia, the meniscus, and then that lateral collateral ligament. And then on the posterior aspect or the back side of the knee, you have the popliteal fossa, which is just that kind of um, pocket, that popliteal pocket, um, that area where there's not a whole lot of stuff. Um, but if you feel something back there, 
or if the patient feels something back there and says, hey, you know, I'm you know, they're coming in today because they, they feel like there's a ball behind their leg or a ball behind their knee. Um, and this can indicate a um, bursa or a, a potential Baker cyst, um, which is that uh, semi-membranous bursa. Usually that indicates that there's a meniscal tear, at least a mild meniscal tear, because that's draining some of the fluid um, back into that popliteal fossa and um, becomes a big old um, bursa. You can do a couple special tests for the knee, the patellofemoral pain syndrome, um, or the patellofemoral grinding test is a test for patellofemoral pain syndrome. It's a really common disorder of the knee um, and a really common reason for patients to come into um, to, uh, the, the, for examination to the, to the provider's office. So um, you will, usually the pain will be into the anterior aspect of the knee, so it's right underneath the patella. So really what happens is the underside of the patella gets a little bit um, irritated or jagged or um, you know, rough. And so that causes some um, pain because the patella is freely mo mobile. If you relax your leg and move your patella around, it moves all over the place. So it has the potential, if it's rough on the bottom side, to kind of scratch and become kind of painful under there. So to test for this, you have the patient supine, you extend the knee, and you compress, you compress the patella against the femur, and then you ask the patient to tighten the quadricep. When you tighten your quadriceps, your patella locks into place. So it doesn't really move then. So when your quadricep is activated, your patella doesn't move. Um, so you want to displace the patella and press it against the femur and then have the patient tighten their quadricep and kind of, that kind of drags the patella back into place. It should be a smooth um, sliding motion while it gets back in place, but it could, um, if there's rough underneath them, then it can cause some pain. You might hear some crepitus or feel some crepitus, and that indicates patellofemoral syndrome. Uh, it's not really, you know, we don't really do a whole lot about it. You can sometimes do, uh, you know, anti-inflammatories when it gets bad enough, but it's not usually operative. Um, most of the time, non-operative treatment is, is, is the gold standard. You can look for uh, knee effusions. Usually these are visible. You should be able to see a knee effusion, uh, but when they're not large, you can do some of these mechanisms or some of these tests to try to uh, make them a little bit more obvious. So there are actually three different tests for detecting fluid in the knee. Um, there, I think your book talks about them. There are the bulge sign, the balloon sign, and then the blotting, the patella. The bulge sign is more for minor um, effusions, and that's the one I think we're going to talk about. I don't think I, I talk about the other one, so if you're interested or you're going to be doing a lot of orthopedics, then you can look in your book um, for the others. But the bold sign, again, is used for small effusions. So to assess for this test, you need to extend the patient's knee, place your hand, your usually your left hand, above the knee, and apply pressure on the suprapatellar pouch, which is that area above the knee, and you're really trying to displace or milk any fluid downward. And then you'll stroke downward on the medial aspect of the knee and apply pressure to force that fluid into the lateral area. So you're milking the fluid down and into that lateral area. And then you tap the knee just behind the lateral margin of the patella with the right hand to see if you can feel any fluid. So I think there's a picture of this. Yeah. You, um, with your hand, milk the fluid down and then you're displacing it to this aspect and then you're tapping it with this finger to see if you can feel it on this side. Sometimes you just, if you do this part of it and you see the effusion, then you know there's an effusion. So this test only really tells you that yes, there's swelling and there's an effusion in the knee, which you know, usually you can see anyway, but this will pick up if it's a little bit smaller. A couple other tests when patients come in saying they hurt their knee is you can um, assess for the anterior drawer sign. So if the patient's supine, the hips and knees flex, the feet flat on the table, you um, generally cup your hands. It might be easier to show a picture. Yeah, you cup your hands around the knee um, with the thumbs on the medial and lateral joint lines, and then you draw that tibia forward. Um, like you're opening a drawer, right? Like you're opening, so you kind of pull the tibia forward and you're looking to see that it slides forward like a drawer does um, 
you know, in your dresser. So it should, a little bit of movement is normal, but it shouldn't be a lot of movement. And certainly it shouldn't be a very asymmetric from the non-affected side. You can also do this with the posture aspect. So you do the same sort of thing, but instead of pulling the drawer out, you're pushing backwards to assess that there's laxity of that. Generally speaking, you won't have a torn PCL without there being a, a torn ACL. So you're not generally, I don't think I've ever heard of a, a torn PCL um, that was, that was um, torn without the ACL being torn also. So the ACL certainly can get torn by itself, but typically the PCL doesn't get torn by itself. If the PCL is injured, the ACL is probably injured as well. Lachman's test is a test for um, ACL injuries. It's a little bit harder to do because the knee is um, you know, in the air and you're having to manipulate the knee, uh, a, a patient's legs, and usually patient's legs are pretty heavy. So, um, but you can do this test by um, externally rotating the knee, uh, a flexed knee, and then you are um, trying to see if there is um, movement as you grab the distal femur and the upper tibia and you're moving them back and forth to see if there's a lot of laxity in that joint. Because remember, the ACL and PCL, they help stabilize this box or this knee. So if you're able to manipulate it forward and backwards, like how this arrow shows you, then that means that there's laxity in that joint and the ACL then is probably injured. Varus and valgus stress tests. These are tests that look at the lateral and medial collateral ligament. So the varus stress test is for lateral collateral ligament and the valgus is for uh, medial collateral ligament. So what you're really doing is stressing the, that ligament out. So if you are trying to assess the lateral collateral ligament, that's the lateral aspect of your knee, then you need to stretch that side. So how do you stretch that ligament? Well, you press out on this aspect of the patient's leg while pressing in on this aspect down by the um, down by the ankle and you're stressing, stretching that lateral collateral ligament. So if there's pain or gap in that joint line, then that can indicate a potential tear or some laxity and strain sprain. You can do the same thing to the medial collateral ligament so with this hand, you kind of push out. So with your hand, you push the lateral aspect of the knee medial while supporting and making sure that you're so you're trying to stretch that medial collateral ligament. So you can press abduct this area while you're adducting this area in order to stretch the medial collateral ligament. If that doesn't make sense, watch your skills video because uh, I demonstrate and talk about it there as well. McMurray test is a test for um, for uh, meniscal injuries. So um, this is a little bit tougher for students to wrap their head around, but you're looking for a popping or clicking along the medial joint line um, when there's extension put on the on the leg, extension with valgus stress on that medial joint. So you're you're testing for the medial joint, putting it through valgus stress, but then externally rotating it and slowly extending it. And you, this is in your video as well. Okay, so finally the ankle and the foot. Um, it's really common for patients to come in for ankle injuries and foot um, foot injuries, you know, sprains and strains. And um, so you want to get a good history, generally the history of the injury, how they injured it, where, which way they twisted it. Uh, and then inspect and palpate all the structures. Look for alignment, look for swelling, look for pain, look for erythema. Um, I did want to talk about briefly about the um, Ottawa ankle rules. Um, because most people are tempted the minute an ankle walks in, an ankle pain injury walks in, just to get an, uh, an x-ray. But generally the x-rays are required if there's pain in the malleolar era, area. So that malleolar area is um, the lateral, medial or lateral, that medial or lateral bone of your ankle. Um, and there should be pain above and around it, not just um, below it, but the pain below, above, and, and on the malleolar malleolar area. Um, so if there's bone tenderness, uh, if there's um, um, inability to walk more than four steps, and that's inability to 
uh, walk immediately and in the emergency department. If they immediately were able to get up and walk when they um, first injured their leg and then the swelling kicked in and now they can't really walk because it hurts too bad, then they may not need an x-ray right away. They can always wait and see if, the, if it starts to improve. Um, but if they have the bone pain distal of the distal to the malleolus and the bone pain um, distal to the fibula or the lateral malleolus and an and an inability to um, ambulate, uh, then you'll want to get the X-rays. Um, then you can also um, sorry, it's going back to inspection though. So those are the auto ankle rules just for X-rays if there's an injury, but um, going back to inspection. So you'll inspect and palpate um, the foot looking in the ankle, looking for alignment, pain, swelling, erythema. You can palpate the Achilles tendon um, and have the patient, um, the easiest way to do this is have the patient kneel on a chair. Uh, so they're kneeling on the chair and their ankle is kind of out towards you and their, so their Achilles tendon is, is um, superior. And you squeeze the calf and you watch for that plantar flexion of the ankle. So if there's absence of the plantar flexion, that can indicate a rupture of the Achilles tendon. Usually that's very, I mean, you'll know that the Achilles tendon is ruptured before that, um, but because uh, they usually come in for a lot of pain, you know, they hurt a pop, they might, you might see the roll, the bulge there. Um, but if you squeeze the calf and there's no plantar flexion of the ankle, it means that there's a rupture of that Achilles tendon. Um, you can also, what's another common, a really common thing for the foot is plantar fasciitis. So plantar fasciitis generally has, um, pain in the, um, medial, excuse me, the, um, the, uh, ball of the foot sometimes, um, or sorry, not the ball of the foot, the ball of the, um, calcaneus, the heel. So there's pain at the calcaneus, generally with, um, walking. Um, it tends not to hurt as much when the patient is, you know, if it's a female patient when they're wearing high heels because they're not pressing on that area and they're not stretching out that Achilles tendon. So a lot of times there's bone spurs in the calcaneus in the, um, in the heel. Um, and the other, another really common thing is a neuroma, Morton's neuroma, which causes tenderness, um, in, in the, um, base of the metatarsals. Uh, and that generally causes very significant pinpoint tenderness. So usually they can feel exactly where it's at. Uh, so make sure you're assessing the foot, looking for redness, looking for swelling, but then pressing around and feeling for these areas. Um, and then putting the ankle through range of motion. The ankle has four different ranges of motion. There's flexion and extension and then inversion and eversion. And these are all in your video as well. So I think we've finished up with this. Yes, this is the end of it. So um, thank you for bearing with me. That was kind of dry and long. But um, watch your skills video, and then the neurologic assessment will be next. Thanks. Bye.